So when this guy says that um, if you've got a Brazilian child, you can stay in the country, did you get this feeling of, yeah, it's, you know, sorted it? No, well, no, because I didn't really sort of put too much faith in him. I mean, most barrack room lawyers don't know what they're talking about anyway. But, uh, but he did seem to be knowledgeable on the subject, you know, and he did seem interested, enthusiastic about doing whatever he could to help me, you know. And he said, what you must do, he said, you've got to get yourself a lawyer and establish the fact that you are the father of the baby that's expected. And uh, if you can do that, he said, then you've got a good chance. Get a, get a lawyer to go to, go to make an appearance in a family court where you'll swear that you are the father. And that's going to, going to assist your case immensely, so because it's going to establish you and you're going to have to stay in Brazil to support the child. Okay. So, so it, it just seemed that it was good news that he was telling me, but I was not prepared to sort of put too much uh, stock in what he was saying because it might not have been true. And I was also expecting that the following day, because this was on the first day when I was captured or taken into custody, and I was thinking that the next day there was still the possibility that I was going to be sort of leaving Brazil with Slipper and Jones and uh, go back to England. So nothing was sort of guaranteed at that particular moment and I was just just hoping. And in the meantime, what I'd done, I'd, I'd managed to get a razor blade. I'd read somewhere about this American guy in a penitentiary and he did all kinds of tricks by swallowing a razor blade, right? The idea is you break it in two pieces, uh, put it in some soft bread, and damp it and just sort of let it slide down and I thought well you know I, I would be prepared to go as far as that to avoid going back once I knew I'd been sort of tricked by the by the express so I managed to filch a razor blade and I was going to sort of do that if it became necessary but it never did become necessary funny enough that razor blade stayed with me I, I hid it in the lining of my shoe and it stayed with me all the time until I went to Brasilia where I was transferred to like a, about a week later after it was established that I was not going to go back to England and I had to sort of be in Brazil to answer to this um, answer this um, parenthood thing with regard to Raimunda. So what's it like in a Brazilian local jail? Oh, it was like, uh, it, it was absolutely unbelievable because when I went into the cell, uh, each of them, there were four other guys in there and it was sort of late in the evening but they all got up and they, they had beds made of, of uh, paper and bits of uh, cardboard and things. And anyway, they all got up and they all sort of got a bit of their bed and made me a bed, you know, because they all wanted to know why there was a gringo in their midst. And, um, but all the time there's one guy and uh, he was making up paper rolls and, and boiling up coffee in the cell. And all up the wall and all around the ceiling, was uh, the, it was like black from where everybody had been making coffee down through the ages, you know. Coffee doesn't stop in, even in the Brazilian prison. It's made up, and the cell would fill up with fill up with smoke, but so, the coffee would come up. So it's like a cowboy jail, you know, just like oh, a, a square, so. you know, a, a square um, concrete thing with, you know, bars and a little window with bars, and that's it. One of the cells was called the presidential suite, and it was like six inches of water in there permanently, like the mosquitoes you can imagine, right? But it really was. Uh, Third world stuff altogether. So what, what about things like you know, the toilets and oh, there was like a, there was like a, just like a uh, in in a corner of the cell. It's like a like a part of a brick low brick wall, and I had a hole in the floor there, and that was it. You know, that would be really pleasant. Oh, it was one of you know because this is the system in Brazil is the last one into the into the cell is the one who sleeps nearest to the where you, where you do your jobs, right? Yeah. And then you sort of move along as people move out. <laughs> what about food? Oh, the food is like diabolical, you know. In any any Brazilian prison, I mean, you're not going to come up with anything like decent food. It was really bad. Um, slight improvement when I went up to Brasilia, because there was a special prison for, for foreigners up there. So I sort of, it was the following week, and then I, when, when it was established that I was definitely not going to go back to England then, like within the within a day or two, I was transferred up to to this prison in Brasilia. So when you say the conditions are a little bit better, what does a little bit better mean? Okay, well I mean there was a bed, albeit made of concrete. Uh, there was a concrete table set in the walls. Don't you, know, you could, couldn't throw anything at anybody, uh, and, the, and the food was marginally better, but uh, nothing to write home about. Like rice and yeah, rice and a little bit of fat meat. I was sort of, you know, getting stuff sent in, biscuits, and you, you could buy, 
you can buy stuff out of your, of your private money, right? So I'll buy things like biscuits and and whatever to uh, to supplement the the food in the jail. And how long did you have to stay in that jail? Oh, I was there for uh, 90 days. 90 days? Yeah, it was three months because it was, a, and then after after 90 days, if I was, there was nothing gonna happen to me like going back to Great Britain, then I was gonna have to be really, because in the meantime, I'd arranged a good lawyer. He's now a minister today, but uh, he was up and coming lawyer in those days, and he was responsible for establishing that I was the father of the child that Raymond was expecting. And also he was the one who finally uh, put in a writ of habeas corpus for my release from that jail after 90 days. And then I was posted in conditional liberty. So um, during that, that three month period, are you allowed to have, say, a radio and books and so on and so forth? Well, that, that, that depended on who was in charge. When I first went there, there was an easy going guy in charge and he had permitted tape recorders and radios and things. And the, the, the big boss was on holiday. Well, when he returned, things changed dramatically, yeah, because out with the radios, out with the tape recorders, this is a prison and not like a holiday camp. And he was like a real, they call him, uh, he was a Durand, which means a very hard man. And he was a hard man, he was sort of but slightly potty, you know, I mean, he would come around checking the padlocks on the cells every night, give them a good tug to make sure they were locked. So they're supposed to be high security, right? So how, how long did you have to stay in this local jail? I was there for 90 days before I was released on a habeas corpus. The lawyer that I did get, who was he was an excellent uh, lawyer, he first of all got me to the family court thing and established, I, you know, I swore that I was the father of the child that was expected. And then he arranged or he, he put the habeas corpus in on uh, when the time was up, the 90 days was up. And then I was released immediately into uh, conditional liberty. So after um, it's finally established that you can stay, um, did you feel relatively safe in, in, um, that you would be allowed to stay in Brazil, or was that still that lingering doubt? Well, when, all I, the time? when I was released initially, I was under orders by the, the, the federal police to look around and find a country that was prepared to receive me. And uh, there were only two other countries in this, in, oh, and, and there had to be a country that did not have an extradition treaty with Great Britain. And there were only two countries that I knew of in this part of the world, it was Costa Rica and Venezuela. Costa Rica denied uh, receiving me because they, they had, they, we got enough trouble with Mr. Vasco, was what they said. And Venezuela said that this man has already passed through Venezuela on a forged passport. We have a charge against him if he comes here. And um, to be quite honest, I was under orders, or under, you know, they told me that I should go around and try and find another country to accept me, but I didn't even bother. And I, I, in fact, I even lied. They, I went down to the police station, if you've been looking around for a place, I said, yeah, nobody wants to know me. So as time went by, so you know, it was established that I was here and I was signing in twice a week at the federal police station. And it just went on year after year after year and uh, it never changed. And then there was a, uh, like we got into the 80s and I was issued for the first time a document for two years. All foreigners in this country were gonna be given a, a document of, of identity uh, for, from the period of 1982 to 84. And I still have this particular document. It's the only identity card that I have. But of course I, sh I present it sometimes and, and people say, well, but this is no good as a document. It went out of date in 1984. I said, well, you know, I say, well, phone the federal police. Do you know who I am? I say, yeah. I said, well, phone the feds and let them sort it out because I don't have another document and they won't give me another document. So, because like, for instance, something arrives at the post office and uh, I get a notification it's there and I've got to go to the, to the post office to collect a parcel of whatever. And I get down there and they say, well, okay, document, to, you know, before you sign, if so present me a document. Oh, this is no good, it's, it's out of date, you know. Don't you have a more recent document? You know, that's all I got. Well, so, because then you get involved with this, uh, this bureaucratic scene, all, always, you know, there's always somebody there who's gonna say, well, you know, I do know who you are, but your document is not in, you know, not in order. This is the way it is. So presumably, if you've got no documents, you obviously got no passport. No. Nobody give you a passport. No. So um, does that mean you can't get a driving license? Can't you know? Can't do all those sort of normal things that you would need to do. That's to correct. That's quite correct. 
So, you've still got to make a living or you still got to eat, you know, and, 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 you know, pay the rent and do all these various things. So yeah. you've got no documentations, um, you can't drive, you, you can't leave the country, you can't do anything, but you have still got to survive. So how do you survive day to day to get, get a few quid? Well, you know, I've, I've, I've had to sort of uh, scam my way through, you know, I mean, I got involved, involved in all kinds of things, I've made t-shirts and I've, I've, you know, I've obviously written books and so I sell books, I sell my name in as much that you know, I've been involved in various bits of advertising. Um, and there's always something happening, always something coming along. Tourists arrive, I charge tourists uh, for, for a barbecue with me. Sometimes it's only like two people, sometimes it's 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50 people come. And I don't know, don't know how I've done it, but over all these years I've managed to get by, you know, in this, like as I say, scamming along uh, as I go, uh, just getting any money, any any money I can, uh, in, in not by honest means, you know, I mean, I'm not about to get involved in any kind of criminal activity again. So sometimes it gets a bit tough, you know, sometimes we get quite broke, get in debt, and then something happens, a piece of advertising that pays off pretty well, and I square off all my debts, and, you know, we, we're back in the race again, as it were. So you're a tourist attraction then, really? To a certain extent, yeah, because I mean, they're, they're, they're funny enough, and I don't know why, I can't explain why, but I, I seem to attract more German and Austrian tourists than any other nation. I meet a lot of Australians, a lot of English people, not too many Americans, but I'm, quite a few Canadians come down. Um, you know, of course, they, they all want to, to listen to the story and they, normally they come and then we sit around and have the food and the drinks and then Someone starts with a questions and answers thing, and I sort of sit here and hold court and answer all their, their inquiries. Lots of these questions have become what I consider to be evergreens now, you know. The, the same question uh, always comes up. Like you know, singing like, the same song when you do a concert, really. There you go, of course. So it strikes me that it's quite an enjoyable sort of lifestyle, really, because you're know, getting paid to have a nice time, really. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's become like a like a job. I mean, uh, these tourists, they like, like I say, a company will ring me up and, and say, you know, like uh, I've got a group coming over on March the fifteenth, and uh, there was twenty seven people, and they would like to have a lunch with you. So you know, the lunch is normally say from one o'clock, and they people hang around till four or five o'clock in the afternoon. I suppose it's a it's, it's a reasonably good job to have. It's a cushy enough job, you know just sitting around talking to people. And, um, you know, I've, I've almost sort of become like a pro professional uh, with regard to, to handling these people. And well, needless to say, the same old questions come up all the time. Um, but, I've, but I have found that I've been well received on these, on these talks. And I mean, for instance, like I did a, for a group of Aussies not too long ago. And one of them came up to me afterwards and said, look, Ron, he said, I'm not pissing in your pocket, he said, but this has really been the highlight of the tour as far as I'm concerned. You know, we've had a bloody good afternoon here. And so they're getting value, you know. I mean, if, if someone pays me $60 uh, to, to have an afternoon of eating and drinking and, and, and my company just talking about whatever, if they go away happy, I consider that I've done a good service, you know. And, uh, and of course, it promotes trade. They go away and say, oh, yeah, we had a great afternoon with Ronnie in Rio. And, and next thing you know, there's another bunch coming in wanting the same treatment. So I've sort of developed the, the, the business, if you wish, the, the, uh, uh, that became known one way or another as the Ronnie Biggs experience. You do any sort of after dinner? Stuff yeah, I've, done, I've done, done a few of those. Yeah, not uh, this time last year. I did one uh, for a New Zealand insurance company. I think there were some 200 odd people in the audience, and you know, after the dinner, I sit down there and make my make my little talk, and then uh, do the questions and answers bit. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I got invited to go to Manaus by a group of uh, American businessmen. They called themselves the, the Young President's Organization. And I was chose to go there to, um, there was about 35 lecturers who went all together, and I was one of them. And my theme was talking about crime and treatment as opposed to crime and punishment. And it was uh, like it was a seven day trip. Uh, everything, everything was paid for. I, I was uh, able to take Mike with me. We had a, it was a great fun trip and uh, very interesting talking to these people. 
And I found that uh, you know, they were not so much interested in my views of, of how to treat crime, but that everybody was quite unanimous in wanting to, to hear the details of the train robbery yet again. So, you know, that was sort of easy ground for me to travel on. And uh, I was sort of not really uh, called upon to talk about what, what my views are on treating crime. You still have to go and sign on at the police station? No, that finished, I, I did that for 17 years. So for, that was from 19, that was from 1974 until 1991. So the, the, the authorities leave you alone now? Yeah, now I'm, I'm not in, uh, in any way uh, bothered by the, by the authorities. Um, what I do know is that the, the position I'm in at this moment, my, my papers or the, the process that I've been involved in all these years has finally gone into the hands of my lawyer here in Brazil. Um, and also, like the, the paper indicated, that I'm now a free person in this country and I'm, I'm here permanently. But now he's going to go after papers that, that will establish my permanency in this country, including uh, possibly a passport and like uh, a, a Brazilian nationality, which is what I'm firing after. What status, what, what that will permit me to do and where it will permit me to move to, I'm not sure. I'm not so, not so sure that I would even think of gambling about taking a trip even close to Great Britain, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even consider going to Ireland. But I might consider going to, to other places. If Australia becomes a republic, I might even try and get myself over there for a, for a little holiday. You know, that would be, that'd be pretty cool, I reckon. Do you ever get homesick for England? No, no, I've been away too long now to get homesick. Uh, you know, like, like uh, it's, it's always nice to meet fellow Brits. It really is. And this is why, and, and also, well, I mean, Australians don't matter because I had four years there and got to like Australian people very much. So when these Aussies come in as a crowd is, I'm normally sort of, uh, I, I very, very rarely see anybody who's not happy about being in my company. So that's, that's quite sort of uh, encouraging with regard to doing these lectures and talks to people. So do all your family still live in Australia? Like your first family? My, my, my ex-wife lives there with one of my two sons and the other one's married now and uh, you know, you moved up to Sydney from Melbourne, where the others live. What do you want to do? You know, if somebody said to you, you can do anything you like, Ronnie, you know, you've now got your part, your papers, would you change your life in any way? I don't think so, Mike, to tell you the truth. It's uh, the, the way things are at the moment. I'm sort of, you know, quite happy with, with my surroundings. I like, I like my home. I, I work on my home a lot. You know, I'm very enthusiastic about the garden. Um, and I, I really don't sort of, uh, I can't think of too many things that I would want to do. I wouldn't want necessarily to go travelling. Um, I'm very modest with regard to my requirements in life, you know, I'm, I'm not a heavy boozer, I like a beer occasionally. But, um, you know, as I say, my, my, my lifestyle is, it suits me down the ground and I don't really visualise any major changes. Not now that I'm sort of, uh, you know, here permanently. So do you reckon you've had a good life? It's been good, it's been full of ups and downs. I've had my share of suffering, uh, heartache, uh, but also at the same time, I must say, I've had my share of laughs and happiness. You know, my, obviously my, my son Mike provides me with, uh, with the happiness of, of, of being a father. Um, needless to say, initially, certainly, I, I miss my other two boys very much. Um, what I am happy about is the fact that I still have like a good relationship with Charmin and the boys after all this time, even though we were separated for, for all these years. What's the best thing that's ever happened to you? Wow. That's the first time I've ever heard that question. I really don't know. The best thing that's ever happened to me, of being born, I suppose. Well, you've done like a million things, haven't you? Yeah, well, so, yeah. So, so, so to pick the best out of a million yeah, is... No, what, yeah, you think, oh, well, that was really... No, so like asking me asking you what the best meal is you ever had, you know, but could you possibly remember the best meal? Like saying, well, like what, what, uh, what records would you take? Would you take onto a desert island? Okay. What's the, what was your lowest point then? Oh, I think my lowest point, without a doubt, was when I lost my son Nick. That was way back in 1971, and uh, when he died, of course, that was like, I came very close to giving myself up. You know, it was like a, it was a very, very heavy moment for me, and it was, without a doubt, the, the most, the saddest thing that's ever happened to me. 
did you find it well you must have found it but the, the fact that you couldn't go to the funeral must have been the most heart-wrenching thing you think or not no no the most heart-wrenching thing was the the, the knowledge of the, the, that I'd lost my first son you know I mean the funeral was sort of incidental to his death um, but but it, you know, it was a body blow <laughs> to put it mildly as far as Charmin and I were concerned you know we both lost some lost the child of ours who we, we both idolized did you have Michael at the time uh, no 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 Mike wasn't born then right. so there's a if you like the no, it's a, it's a it wasn't a replacement in yeah. any way. No, I, I wouldn't say that. It, it, um, Mike's arrival didn't replace the loss of Nick. You know, Mike provided me with a lot of happiness, but uh, but you know, the sadness still remains until today with regard to the loss of uh, my eldest son. I have to say, you seem to get on fabulously well with Mike. You know, so you know, me looking at it, it looks like very much a sort of a mate's relationship as opposed to a father go and sit over there and do as you're told yeah well I've never been a heavy father like that I always had a good relationship fun relationship with my boys in Australia uh, you know it was always a fun scene I was always playing with them I used to like to you know, I used to dash home from work so that I could have like you know a play time with the kids and it was always like lots and lots of fun and you know I've been Mike's virtually Mike's only parent all these years and I brought him up very sort of Loosely, I suppose, you know, giving him a, a, a lot of rain. Um, and because I believe in letting a child him to express itself, you know, I mean, he's developed his character as it is. He's developed his, you know, what, what pleases me immensely is the fact, is the knowledge that none of my kids have ever had to sort of become crooks. There's a, but there's obvious reason why, why people do get into it in that kind of building. And there's also lots of cases where villains in England uh, their, their kids have sort of followed in their father's footsteps. And one of the things that I'm very happy about is that, that I came to Brazil, and I, by not going back to England, I might have gone back to England, done my time, come out, my kids are over there with me in London, like Nick and Chris, um, Chris and Farley. Um, and they might well have gone into a different way, into a crooked way of life, as I, as I had, as a result of sort of living in London and they've been involved in that sort of crime scene, visiting the old man in the nick and all that. So they, they've been able to avoid that. And of course, needless to say, Mike's as straight as a die and uh, you know, they all know the story. They all know the old man's been in all kinds of bother. But I think that's part and parcel of, the, of keeping them straight, you know. I mean, my Mike doesn't condemn me in any way for having been involved in villainy, but uh, you know, I mean, he knows sufficient about me to know that he, he can't get involved in any way in, in anything that's against the law. So where's his mum now? His mother lives in Switzerland. She's in Geneva. And uh, she's got a life of her own there. Well, we, we are all on friendly terms. She rings every few weeks and you know, I have a chat with her, Mike has a chat with her, and then it's some, from time to time she arranges a fare for him to go over there and visit her for a while. So we're still like one big happy family. Like uh, It's nice to say. I'm, uh, the, the, I'm still very good friends with Raymond and with Charmian. So you, so you said that um, there would have been the danger that your kids w could have got involved in villainy had the circumstances been slightly different. Does that mean that, you know, did you come from a family of villains? How did you No, get no, to, no, to the contrary. I don't, there's nobody in my family at all who could be considered a villain in any which way. Um, uh, and to, to try to, to get down to a conversation about how and when I got into villainy is, you know, I would have to sort of look for the, for the very, very first time when I was put, in, put into a position where I had to steal something. And I can, re I can very well remember, I had this childhood friend called uh, Dennis Vickers, and um, he was stealing money from his mother's purse, and of course we were both spending the proceeds. And then one day he put it to me, and it seemed fair to me at the time, uh, that you know he was there yeah you know, well I've been nicking money from my mum for the past whatever you know what about you having a go and see what, what you can come up with in, in that fashion I started stealing from my mother's purse and you know we went from sort of if you wish strength to strength to strength um, like we would go shoplifting in, in candy stores and things like that and this is all part and parcel of I mean you may well have done it yourself as a child you know pinch candy bars or toy soldiers from uh, from whatever and then it just went as I as the time went by and I I wanted to run with a certain pack of kids that uh, 
ruffians, you know, my mother forbade me to go anywhere near these these children. But of course, my my joy was being accepted into the into the gang of ruffians, you know, and I wanted to be one of them. I didn't want to sort of go to school and have my socks pulled up and my cap square on my head. I wanted to be, you know, one of these young tough guys in, in the street and hang on the backs of trucks and and pinch stuff out of the, the stores in Brixton. That, that brothers... seemed to me a more exciting life than sort of, you know, uh, you know, doing the things that my mother was insisting that I do. Of course, I would get well beaten up if uh, if she ever found me sort of up to any nonsense other than coming straight home from school. I used to have to sort of uh, do things every Saturday. My, my mother was a very strict person. Every Saturday morning, as soon as breakfast was over, my sister and I, we had a, a whole bunch of work to do. There's no going out to play. We had to work until midday to earn a little bit of money. I, I had to polish every single bit of brass that was in the house. And we had those brass things in the front room and the, and the parlor and the front step, the knocker, the whole nine yards, all the stair rods. And it used to take me about four hours to do all this with the, with the old Duraglit, you know. Uh, but that was, it was part and parcel. My mother used to work very hard on the house, keeping it clean. And that was my Saturday morning job. And then, then after that, I'd be on my skates, running errands for the neighbors to pick up another sixpence or a shilling perhaps doing errands. So it was a tough life as a kid, you know, I mean, work, working class London was, was pretty tough, but as I said, what, what appealed to me more than anything was being accepted in this, in this group of kids that were sort of, you know, the ruffians in the neighborhood. It just seemed to me there was more adventure and more, uh, more excitement to, to run around with those guys and than other kids who wanted to just sort of play, play cricket in the street, you know. Well, it does strike me actually that Given that uh, you know you're a pretty good chippy and you know you got a little building firm and so on and so forth, that perhaps the motivation for this villainy was um, a bit of a hobby, really. You know, it was a bit. You know, life was pretty boring and humdrum, going up and making a few shelves or some window frames or whatever. And uh, rather than take up fishing or stamp collecting, it's always you know I'll do a bit of villainy because it's exciting. Is that fair? Uh, also, but there was a better payoff in them because when I left school, finally, I, I, I had three years at this school of building in Brixton. And uh, after four years, the, the principal invited my father there and said, look, you know, uh, I would say that it's better for you to take your son out of this school now before we have to throw him out next year. And so, like, you know, my father's a bit disappointed about the fact that I was not going to continue for another three years study. And I said I was anxious to get a job and, and earn some cash and stuff like that. My mother had died in the meantime. And so um, that was really what, what set me on the road to crime then, because when I went to this school, I didn't have, you know, my, my, my father was working, my mother was not around anymore. And in the last year of the first three years at this building school, I was sort of stealing things to order for the rest of the students, you know, they would be sort of. Uh, studying certain subjects and they would want certain books or other material and I would go to art stores in the West End and sort of spend the whole day hoisting. Stealing stuff from stores was sort of a, it was so easy for like a, a 14 year old kid just to go from like shelf to shelf picking up whatever and virtually walking out the store with it and then I would take it back to the school the next day and, and sell my sell my produce. And I said, I used to, I used to, look, a, a kid might want a set of drawing instruments, and normally you might have to, say, pay three, three pounds or four pounds for a set of drawing instruments. And I would, I would steal a set and, you know, sell them for ten bob and things like that. So, all that's well and good, and, you know, I guess everybody's, like, been offered a dodgy telly or whatever, but when you get caught doing it, and, um, first time like you're warned and so on and so forth but the, the first time you do something proper and they lock you away why doesn't that put you off well because uh, you, you find out that imprisonment is not the, the terrible thing that you might think it is you know I mean there's there's people in the situation that you're in you know that other guys doing time this guy's doing more time than you're doing you, you might be doing two years and then the guy next door to you might be doing six or seven and like the, there's a certain degree of comfort from that, you know, your, your release date is sort of, uh, can be seen, and his is sort of in the far distance. But there's sort of a certain camaraderie that goes on inside of prison, you know, like you're all 
you're all crooks and uh, you're all crooks together, you know. Um, and there's always, as I said, there's a certain bond, a certain friendship that exists among the among the people, and you and you make your own fun. I've always been able to sort of produce like a, a reasonably comfortable, not comfortable, certainly uh, like a happy kind of a life in a prison, making the best of a, of a given situation. You know, it might appear to be tough. The fact that you've got to sort of uh, knuckle down to that food and you've got to be banged up at certain things, but you get used to it. And it's sort of, you know, well, it's a, then you say, well, yeah, I can handle it. So when you come out finally, uh, you, you know that you don't want to go back in again, obviously, but you're prepared to take the chance because you know that it's not such a terrible thing as it, as it was cracked up to be before you went away. So once you've been in there once or twice or three times, then okay, you, can, you know you can do bird. And you know you can sort of go back again if necessary, so you're prepared to take the chances. You, you do everything not to go back, of course, but in the event of uh, you being found guilty and you know, we're going to put you into prison for three years, you sort of take it on the chin and get on with it. Well, you don't do everything not to go back again, because obviously the simple thing well, would okay. be to like make the building firm a, you well, know, a bit course, more yeah. successful. Well, then, well, with regards to my building business at the time of the train robbery, you know, I, I, it was sort of on a shoestring. Um, and once the the sum of money was mentioned, the forty thousand pounds, you know, I visualised that I could buy ladders and scaffolding and uh, rent a yard and sort of you know, really sort of build the business right up. As that's what my that's what sort of attracted me more than anything to think what I could do with the business I had, how much I could improve it. But um, well, you know, it was a good way of passing the time. Yeah. <coughs> El Salvador? No. no. Not so good. For me. Still going on. But, you know, so they still had the clubs with like the It was much more. Like up around the back. The judge. Judge. Not, and be not judged, that's all I can say. So, um, I've been back there. Yeah. So if you go there now, Go by standing on the, on the actual road, you know, it's amazing. A bit louder. Oh, well, that's, that's all right. It's past lobby. I don't want to make the noise. It's the old flash bang wallet. I like it. Simple question. What do you think of when you hear the name Ronnie B? Um, Rio. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee. Sex pistols. <laughs> My dad, I think of. Why? Because he's from East London. He's always. You know, when, he, when I said I was going to Rio, he said, do we have to try and look on the pigs? We've got to send him something, we've got to send him something, have we? I mean, we can't just say I saw him, you know, I mean, I've got to write on your back or something, even though I'm in the animal. Can I take a photograph before I'm meeting you? <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what would that entail? Shaking hands. I don't want to worry you folks, but it's going to belt down my right hand. Is it? Right, 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 let's go. Oh, oh, we're used to it. But let's take the photos first. Yeah. So let's take the pictures. Yeah, this, 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 this is for your daddy. This is my daddy, yeah. Right. Here, I'm taking good care of it, don't worry, Dad. How old is he now? He's about 62. Well, that's my age, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Who's next? Oh, Stay here, shall we? We're all right. We don't need to change if it happens. Yeah. 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 Look at that, hey, look, we're famous. Are we? <laughs> What's your dad's name? Jerry. Jerry, well, 
give Jerry my best regards. I will do. And tell him that uh, I'm glad to think that you're <laughs> fans, I hope. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Can I have one? Of course. What, a kiss? Oh. No, 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 kiss. With us in the background. Ah, oh, you small sports. Just come on. Uh, Will you get it this way? Do you want, do you want me on the background? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. All right. How about that? It's a lovely view. So you are? Danny. Danny, that's right. Yeah. All right. This is Danny. Four, one, two, three. All right. Three. All the way from the yeah. UK, from Brom. Yeah. Oh. From He's it. got a motorbike. Yeah. <laughs> do the same thing. Good on you, Danny. Do you mind? Cheers, mate. From Birmingham. Oh. oh. I knew, this, oh, I, 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 knew this, I knew this kid when I was in the Air Force. He, he used to say, I've got a motorbike. I like to get on the open road and let her rip. <laughs> <laughs> I like to get on the open road. Go, All right. Okay. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I wish I could stay as long as you. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you can. Uh, I'm you And after you know the approach to this story. Oh, yeah. Now what about you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, 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 gonna give you a hug. It's a last one. What a what a pair of hands. Is he a cameraman? We're good. We're good. We learned it properly for ten years. What do you play? Oh, lots of things. Peppy J, Tambourine. Just check. Cashier. It's just we're checking. Everybody come. Ah, Deb's learning. Yeah, we haven't got a queen to play yet, but we will be soon. When, I, when, when the sex business came in the first time, uh, we, I took him to the parade and he went, What's that? Then? What are they, wanking machines? Well, if we ever make a record, we'll know. Oh, please do. Yeah, I love it. Well, That's our plan, anyway. Yeah, right. Ronnie Big's real, isn't it? Yeah, and I'll kill it. Mm. Oh, that'd be wonderful. What, you and and all success to you. Yeah. Aren't they beautiful? Aren't they just wonderful? Come and join me, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> What's your views now, like on a life of villainy? Given that you've done both, you know you've had a life of villainy. In fact, half your life was a life of villainy, and the second half has been a life free of villainy. Well, it's been like a what the way I see it. It was almost a blessing in disguise. The fact that I did get at 30 years, and the fact, of course, that I managed to get away, because um, all these years, I mean, it's been over my head the possibility of going back to prison. So all the time I've been in Brazil, I've obviously made a, like a concentrated effort never to get involved in any kind of uh, problem with the law whatsoever. I mean, I don't even have a traffic offence behind me or anything of that nature. So the, 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 the 30 years acted to all intents and purposes like a suspended sentence. Uh, it was there, and of course all the time I kept my nose clean, I wasn't going to have to be kicked out of Brazil and go back and uh, pay the price for my previous crime. And what I'm happy about and, and uh, what, I, what I respect is the fact that here in Brazil, if you stay away from, uh, let's say, a life of crime, or I mean, you can commit any crime in Brazil, but if you can prove that you, uh, that, that you can sort of clean up your act, if you can establish the fact that you're not going to get involved in anything else over a given time, I think it's 12 years for robbery. If you stay clear of any kind of uh, problem for 12 years, then automatically you're, you're absolved of, of that particular crime. And you can even return to the area where you were living and nothing will be done about it. So this is what I've taken advantage of, the fact that my crime uh, prescribed, uh, or the time prescribed, and I was able to be given, I was literally given a chance to, to re-establish my life in Brazil and, and it's like this, I've got this golden opportunity now to sort of live out the rest of my life legally and hopefully uh, you know, with, with full Brazilian documentation and the rest of my life should be hopefully like crime free. I mean there's no reason why I should ever get involved in any uh, monkey business ever again. So prison is a deterrent but 
not when it comes in small chunks. Not when it cut, yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there was a there was an attitude that uh, you know, give a give somebody a short, sharp sentence in a detention centre with lots of marching and lots of drill and all that kind of thing. I, I don't personally believe that works. Um, I mean, the, the the attitude seems to be okay, you, as you said earlier on. You commit your first offence, and the magistrate uh, ticks you off, or, or maybe puts you on a probation order or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, you're, you're, you're made to feel that you're, 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 you're convicted. You've got to go see the probation officer every, every couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, th th this, this, the attitude, I mean, the, 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 the actual help that you get from a probation officer is, is almost zero. Um, and I don't think, that maybe they do a, a, a certain job in a certain way, but I don't know, it, it just seems to me that it doesn't actually work out okay when you've got to sort of have this guy breathing down your neck and saying you've got a job, you know, you, you're staying out late at night, and et cetera, et cetera. I suppose that's, what, that's the way they've got to do their jobs, but uh, it doesn't seem to sort of do anything for, for the young offender. It's not as though, you, you, he doesn't act like a counsellor. He doesn't sort of say, okay, you know, your, your uh, case is particular to me and I'm going to make sure that I am going to help you to, to, to get your feet back on the ground and, and set you up again. He, he sits in his office, you go there, and he asks his sort of set questions, you know, got a job yet, blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't, it, it's not sort of personal enough. He doesn't come close enough to the person to, 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 to make friends with the person, for example, you know, and say, right, you know, you're a particular case and I want to help you. I really want to sort of do something for you. It's all very, very impersonal. It's, it's like, I'll tell you what's similar to, it's like the, the, the jury system as it exists at the moment. They'll, they'll pick, say, say, 12 people from, from whatever walk of life to let them sit and judge possibly a very complex case where they don't even begin to understand any of the forensic evidence that is being put forward. They don't even begin to, to some of them nod off with, you know, they're bored by the spectrographic test and spectrographic this, that and the other. They don't even know what a spectrograph is, for God's sake, you know. And it's always been my opinion that people on juries that they should be selected from a certain body of people who do understand these these aspects of, uh, of, of technology and uh, and the technical aspects of, of, of proving crime. They've got to be able to sort of sift that evidence. Uh, like in in my particular case, when when my trial was on, uh, an inspector was giving evidence and and he made a mistake, a, a glaring mistake, because he indicated to the jury by by what he said that I had been in prison before, and this is a thing that's not allowed to happen in any court. But he came up with this remark that I'm supposed to have said to him when he asked me when I'd last seen Bruce Reynolds, I replied, I last saw Bruce when we were doing bird together. Right, so needless to say, that, okay, it was slang, fair enough. The fact that I was saying, did bird, I was supposed to have said done bird together, or doing bird together. And then the, the, everything stopped in the courtroom and my lawyer popped over and sort of had a little natter with me and uh, then he went off to talk to the judge and then he came back again and said the judge says he doesn't think the jury picked up that remark. Okay, well what's the jury there for if they're not going to pick up remarks? That, that's, that's why they're chosen. If they're irresponsible, if they're sort of dumb enough and, and uh, sleepy enough and, and uninterested enough not to get involved in the job, because it's, the jury thing should be a job as such, you know, with people who who, uh, who have the mental uh, level to, to sift the, the, the evidence as it comes across. Not it's going to be like some, some farmer or some, some street labourer or, or anything, you know, some, some housewife who doesn't even know, uh, the, 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 didn't even know, for example, that, that, uh, that the, the inspector should not be indicating to the court that I've done time before. So I can see and appreciate why you've got this cynical view with regard to um, not the law, but the trying to stop people from breaking the law, the, 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 the way that the probation service works and, and so on. But do you think you've got a cynical view of life in general? Has it made you generally cynical? I wouldn't say cynical. I, was, I, I think I've got a more matter-of-fact approach to things now. You know, I mean, I, I don't believe in, like, the, the, the flim-flam that goes on in the courts. You know, like, we're going to give you another chance. We're sending you to Borstal. Now that's bullshit, man, whatever way you slice it. 
because you're not going to get another chance by going to Borsal, not as Borsal uh, was, or perhaps is even until today, because you're going to go off to a place where there's another big crowd of hooligans, you're going to be treated like just another con, uh, except that you're going to have to maybe work harder, and you're going to have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go off and, uh, into the fields and, and do whatever farm work. Um, so, so I don't sort of see any value in, in this particular Borstal training. What are you being trained in? You're not being trained in anything because this is something... No, when I was a, a young prisoner, I was in a, went to a prison called Lewis, and there they had a vocational training course, which was wonderful, which I took full advantage of. I, I learned my elementary skills in carpentry uh, while I was doing a, a, some time. Great. But what about all the other guys that they were... You know, there were so many people in there. Somebody had to sew the mailbag. Somebody had to do the cleaning. Somebody had to make the baskets. But I, when there was this vocational training course, which was admirable. All the material you need is always available. But this is only like a, it's almost as if it's like a pilot plan. This should be automatic in all prisons. When you go away, you're going to be doing something constructive. If you can't read or write, you're going to, you're going to learn. And there's so many sort of illiterate people who go to prison. And all these people should be sort of in one place so that they can all be schooled. They can all have ele elementary education, if that's, what, if that's necessary. And so like, the, the crime itself that's been committed is, is sort of take, falls into to, to a second place because now what's important is to re-establish that person into society, to reintegrate the person uh, and let him become just a, a regular Joe like his, like his fellows. And uh, I don't think it can ever happen by put, just banging people up, you know. I said, OK, well, you know, you're just a, a useless mess. We're going to put you away for five years. You're a menace to society, etc., etc., where you will be virtually forgotten. End of, the t end of the story. You go away and you do your time and you come out. You're no better off than you were when you went in financially, whereas you should have been able to sort of at least do a job and be able to put money away. So often in the past, there have been guys who have come out of prison, released with 10 bob, right? And then you've got to find digs, you've got to find money for food, and you've got to find yourself a job. Now, you've got 10 bob to do all those things on, and it was virtually impossible. So there were so many guys who were going straight back to villainy the very, very first day out. One guy I remember in particular, he came out in the morning and he grabbed some money off the counter in a bank and he was back inside in the afternoon. Uh, my point is this, that I think there should be like strict segregation and people, young people should be in a young people's establishment. Murderers should be like in, in obviously a place where there's, where there's a, a staff of the train to take care of these particular kind of, they're in, they're in a class on their own. Like a murderer is, is not necessarily a thief, especially like it's a crime of passion or whatever, you know. And these people also should be segregated. Um, because like uh, it doesn't seem right that, that you can get a, a, like, a person who's involved in a, in a sex murder or a sex crime of any, any kind whatsoever. I don't think they should be mixed with the general run of the run of the mill thieves and things like that. I don't think I think these people should have places where they are all going to go so that, for instance, like uh, any person who goes into prison who's involved in a, a serious sex crime is going to be molested by the other prisoners almost immediately, right? Uh, I remember there was one particular, he was a rapist, uh, Albert Jones, and somebody, he was like only been in the prison a couple of days, and somebody threw a bucket of boiling hot cocoa over him. Okay, well now the guy's already been tried for his crimes, he's been sentenced to whatever, and then the idea is for him to go to prison and get on with it. But he shouldn't be in a, put in a position where he can be molested by other people who have got something against sex offenders for whatever reason. I'm not particularly fond of sex offenders, but an offender is an offender whatever way you slice it. Like I was an offender, there are sex offenders and there are other thieves. But I think it's wrong to just lump them all together and bang them up. So are these people born or is the, does the environment create it or what makes a criminal? Okay, well, I mean, because once again, under the heading criminal, I mean, we, we, we discuss like sex offenders and, and thieves and burglars and spies, and they're all criminals. And uh, you can't say that all those people involved in all those different crimes are born into that or whether they sort of drift into it. With regard to theft, I've got a strong feeling that people who get involved in theft are people with, 
with weak mentalities. Uh, they're, they're not strong enough uh, mentally to, uh, to, to resist the temptation to steal. They, 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 uh, I rather feel that I would say yes that people who are involved in crime are born criminals. When I say crime, I mean like theft and you know, uh, crime in, in, in the terms of like stealing and uh, burglary or not necessarily violence because once again that's also in another category of people who sort of get a lot of fun out of uh, getting involved in a fight and then they, they'll go away for five or ten years like for, for grievous bodily harm. Down to a down to an argument or whatever, but once again they're lumped into the same prison with the thieves and the, and the other sex and the sex case and whatever. Do you think crime's changed though since your day? Because my perception is that your generation was a very clear cut one. In the it's a sort of a goodies and baddies situation, and in fact probably the train robbery was the last of the old type of hold up sure, crime I agree, I agree with that. and in those days you know that you had the rosers and you know the blaggers and you know and there was a respect for one against the other you know because there was that sort of environment you know and the policeman wore the trilby hat and the, you know and all this sort of stuff and it almost in a comic book sort of way right. but nowadays do you think perhaps it's much heavier than that and, and perhaps crime is more of a a proper business. Well then one might ask, uh, perhaps the system when it was harsher was better than it is today by treating people like lightly for their crimes. It might sort of indicate that uh, we, we need to go back to hard labour and, um, and, and a much sort of, as I say, harsher regime inside prisons. Um, but then on the other hand, now that we're sort of as, uh, probably as a result of the war, you know, there, there are arm, arms available easily. Uh, sophisticated arms are, are available, and probably in England also now. Um, and there's a whole different attitude, and it did it did start swaying over to the other side in the in the mid '60s. And then, like the you know, when, when guns were first used in bank robberies and things of that nature. But the hard regime never stopped you, though, did it? No, it didn't, because maybe it was, it was because it was not hard enough. You know, I mean, also though, don't forget if you like, like uh, we were talking about Frank Fraser. Frank Fraser been like 40 years in prison, and his claim to fame is that he's never taken advantage of a single day's remission because he was a tough guy, and because you know that they couldn't crack him, and that was that was uh, like like his claim to fame, the fact that, that he was uncrackable. You know, they could. They could hit him on the head with his sticks as often as they liked, but uh, they would never break his spirit. They never did. But he was certified. True, OK, but I mean, it's very easy to get certified. I mean, there's probably a lot of sane people who have been certified for doing whatever, because initially when he was certified, it was for, it was for, for thumping the, uh, the doctor on his, when he was taking his medical to go in the army. And he wanted to avoid going in the army, so he thought, well, I've got to do something about this. And, went across the table and, and, and thumped the doctor. Right. Okay, so they put him away in the loony bin for that. But I mean, what, was that an act of madness or was it just like an, a, a, a way of escaping going into the army? But they would, cert they would certify at the top of a hat. They'd like, for instance, if, you, if you've got a reputation for not taking anything from screws and, and, and thumping screws, which was also what Frank did, um, then he would be threatened by the prison government, another act like this and we're going to sort of put you away. Of course, and then, then uh, it was soon enough where Frank was throwing another right-hander and, uh, and being put away again. I don't think the man was mad, uh, no, no more than he thinks it, but he was a violent person, is a violent person probably, and, um, but, but uh, not necessarily mad in the sense of being put away into an asylum. So, so Frank, if you like, is the, um, the archetypal hard man. Exactly. Um, was he violent to like ordinary people, or is it was it only confined to his, um, as it were, criminal colleagues that he was paid to sort out, and and as a as a consequence, the authority that was there to tame him. Well, they would hardly be his colleagues. 
Was he? No, I mean colleagues in in the sense of within a com, uh, a criminal fraternity. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's like what what he virtually sort of restricted his uh, his aggressive attitude to. As opposed to you know in a pub you know you looking at my girlfriend back. Oh, I mean well that that you know. was I mean you probably you, you yourself remember things like that. I mean it was a thing to go to a dance on a Saturday evening at the Locarno or the Lyceum. And you were going to be Mr. Marshall, and there was some some bloke going to, you know, looking your girl up and down, and you say, you know, you looking at my bird, mate, and it was that is exactly what it was—a chance to sort of have a tear up, a punch up, and you know, so often you could go to a pub or a dance hall in England, and and you could almost guarantee the fight's going to break out. Now, funny enough, in this country, all the years I've been here, I think I've only seen about four fist fights in the street. In all these years, because yeah. of placid natured people. Yeah, and uh, you know, I suppose when they when they get really uh, wound up and annoyed, they can sort of you know, this is there was a I had a friend here, you know, and he was quite aggressive, and you know, sort of soon, especially when he's driving his car, somebody cut him up or whatever, he would be very aggressive. And I said to him, you know, you can't afford to do that in this country because people they don't take they don't take uh, threats and insults easily. And they'll go to their car and they'll get their gun out the glove box and blow you away, you know. And it's, that's what, what would happen before a fist fight would happen. But there's not too much of that, thank the Lord. So, were you a tough guy in your youth? Never, never. No, I'm a very placid person, you know. I was, I was never a, a hooligan as such, even though I like to hang out with them. So your um, view to villainy was to make your material life a bit more comfy as opposed to the machos then? Of uh, course. Right. Yeah. I was never a cosh boy, I've never sort of committed any act of, not personal, not personally anyway, act of violence against anybody, I've never sort of coshed anybody or anything of that nature. But of course I was with people who carried coshes on the train robbery. And needless to say, I have to sort of share that responsibility. But I was one of the people that was not armed on the train robbery. There were certain people there who had jobs to do and it was not necessary for them to sort of carry a, carry a club of any description.